Glad you came up here. You're so brave. <laughs> How are y'all this morning? Good. I see smiles on people's faces. You feeling good? Yeah. Are you glad that Sophia came? You're, you've got something sticking out of your lips. <laughs> you better put it back in. I'll get it. I'll get it. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you. Happy Sunday. Tomorrow is, what did the preacher say tomorrow was? Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. And we, ha- we celebrate Valentine's Day to what? What do you think? What do you think? Celebrate God, yes. And we celebrate those that we love. Yes, that's right. You took your shoes off? Okay. Don't forget to put them back on before you leave. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So, guess what I'm going to be talking about today? We're talking about love. Love, yes. And so, for the past couple of Sundays, we've been talking about how we can be after God's heart, like David was. And do you know, do you think that God is after our hearts all the time? You think so? You think he, he loves us and thinks about us all the time? Maybe? Kind of? You think so, Sophia, number yeah. five? Yeah. Four. Uh, You're four. four. Now You're five. five. <laughs> so we're going to, let me just remind you of uh, the scripture that we read last week. It was in Ephesians chapter 4, and it's verse number 32. It's the very last verse in that chapter. And it says, And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So we've talked about how we can please God by obeying Him, and we can please God by being kind to one another. And today I want to focus on that word that says forgive. What do you think forgive means? What does it mean? That's right. When somebody does something that hurts you and they say, I'm sorry, and then you forgive them, right? And what does that mean? Does that mean you're mad at them still and you hold it over their head that they messed up? No, it just means that you forgive them, right? And you can be friends again, right? Has anyone ever done something to hurt you? No. Has anyone ever had to say they're sorry to you? Yeah. Yeah. Did you forgive them? Yeah. And I think that is a wonderful, wonderful thing that God gives us. He gives it to us because that's who he is. He gives. He is a giving God so much that he gave his only begotten son. Do you all know that John 3, 16 verse? Let's say it together. It's like one of my favorite verses. You ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that a great verse? Mm -hmm. He loves us so much that he gave his very best and that's his son Jesus. And he wants us to do the same. In verse number 32 here it says, Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And the good thing, the most wonderful thing about God is that when you mess up and you ask for forgiveness, he forgives you. And he does it not ten times, not a thousand times, not one million times. But over and over and over again. Why? Because he loves you 
that much. And his love and forgiveness is everlasting. But here's the thing. You've got to ask for that forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You've got to ask. So let's practice this. I brought, I brought gifts. But the only way you can get the gift is if you ask for it. Does anybody here want the gift that I brought them today? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's practice. Yeah. Sophia number five. Let's practice asking for a gift. You want to try it? Mm -hmm. Okay, try it. I'll take it. No. <laughs> Kit, let's try. May I have my? <laughs> may I have my gift, please? Let's try that. May I have my gift, please? Yes, you may. Does anyone else want to try? Yeah. Okay. So, for your number four. Yes. <laughs> yes, you may. Anybody else want a gift today? It's okay. What's the worst that could happen? You get a gift. <laughs> you can be brave. How about you just hold out your hand and say, please? Okay. That is awesome. Would you like to try? Okay. Yes, you may. And that is nowhere near how wonderful God is. But that is just a tiny little smidgen. You could ask all day long for whatever you need, whatever you need help with. We just got to be brave enough to ask, right? He mm -hmm. gives and gives and gives, and we just need to be brave to ask. And he, you know what? He gives his very best. He gave us his son, Jesus. All we need to do is ask for his love and his forgiveness. And um, I just want you all to remember that, okay? When we celebrate Valentine's Day tomorrow, we, we celebrate those that love us, and we celebrate God who loved us first, right? Mm -hmm. All right, and we'll ask the pastor to pray for us. Father, thank you so much.
Turn with me this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. <clears throat> Matthew, chapter 5, beginning with verse number 21. <clears throat> This is, of course, the Sermon on the Mount. So these are the words of our Lord. And he said in verse 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. <clears throat> and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. <clears throat> and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of 
with hell fire. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word today. <clears throat> What I want to talk to you about this morning is the danger of anger. The danger of anger. Because when you get right down to it, they are practically the same thing. If you got anger and you add a D to it, what do you have? Danger, right? And isn't it interesting how we hear more and more about how many people in our world today have a problem with anger? <clears throat> Oh, they've got such a problem with anger. But I believe that the real problem with anger is that we're trying to use it as an excuse. We're trying to use it as a means of explaining and somehow justifying cruel and stupid behavior. That's the real problem with anger. How many people have you ever heard make the statement, I just can't control my temper? And then they seem to want you to believe that that makes everything okay. That that excuses them, that removes any and all responsibility from them for their actions and their words. So they can basically do or say whatever they want to, and you're supposed to remember, oh, they can't control their temper, so it's okay. Let's just forget about it. Deal with it better than others. You're not the only one. Okay? You're not some kind of special, unique case. And when you get right down to it, anger is really just a symptom of the problem. It is not the real source, it is not the true cause of our real problem. No, our real problem is a spiritual matter. And it relates not to the lack of control that we have over our anger and other emotions, but rather to the lack of control that God has over us. That's the real problem. That's the real issue. In fact, anger and being angry is not wrong in and of itself. It is what our anger causes us to do and to say that gets us in trouble. The Apostle Paul said that we are to be angry and sin not. And so we can infer from his statement then that it is indeed possible to be angry and not sin. To sin not. So in other words, we are to be in control of our anger. We are to be in control of our temper not the other way around. The truth is we all struggle with this to a certain degree. It's a problem that we all face. I know that for me personally, I face my greatest challenge with it when I'm driving. <clears throat> now, I don't have road rage. I really don't. But I do admit that sometimes I get miffed with people, sort of miffed with their inconsiderate, their thoughtless, their obnoxious, their dumb driving habits. <laughs> Just a little miffed, okay? You probably got things that you struggle with that are a greater challenge for you. It's something we all have to deal with from time to time. But listen, it is also true that we can control our anger. Yeah, he said that. It is possible to hold our temper in check. How, you might ask? With the Lord's help. With His help. Because Jesus can help us to overcome anything and everything in our lives. He really can. Uh, it is, the fact of the matter is that He can help us to do all things. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So He can help us. If we'll just do two things. Number one, we have to admit that we have a problem. 
We have to say, you know, I, I have this situation in my life and I'm not able to fix it on my own. I can't solve this by myself. And so number two, we have to turn to Him. Say, Lord, please help me with this. I need your help. I need your strength. And He can and He will help us. And so the, the bottom line of it is, is that uh, the degree to which you are able to control your anger is directly related to the degree to which the Holy Spirit of God has control of you and your life. It's simple, really. The more that we are filled with God's Spirit, the less room there will be for anger to get in and take over. And so we really need to do this. We need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. We need to surrender control of ourselves to God's Spirit. Because Jesus is telling us here in these two verses that anger is a very dangerous thing for us as God's people. He says that anger puts us in danger of being suspected of murder. Suspected of murder. Look at what we've read there again, verse 21. He said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. So he's talking about the commandment. Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Danger, danger, danger. So where is the danger? Why is anger such a dangerous thing for us as God's people? Well, there is no greater crime that can, that can be committed than that of taking the life of another person. Murder is the big one, right? It is the worst possible offense that a human being could ever be accused of. And yet the Bible tells us in 1 John that whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. That's what it says. So that anger inside of us towards another Christian, if it is left unresolved, if it goes unaddressed, uh, over time, it can get to the place and it can grow and cause us to hate them someday. And my friend, when that happens, we will be guilty of murder in God's eyes. That's what His Word says. Whether we physically uh, kill them or not, Jesus said that we are in danger of being judged for it anyway. I'm convinced that the key word here is is. There in verse 22, Jesus says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother. So he's talking about somebody who's angry as a present and ongoing condition. The Lord's talking about somebody who gets angry and stays angry. Their anger keeps going. It keeps burning inside of them. It does not go away. They have no intentions of it going away. They have no intentions of moving from is angry to was angry. No intentions of ever letting it go. They are dug in and they're dug in deep. That's who he's talking about here. I really believe that. And so he revealed the facts here that must be established in order for us to be convicted of murder. The first of which he said was to be angry with our brother. Verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother. Okay? So this is a crime that can only be committed by God's people against God's people. Lost people are not subject to this particular judgment. 
They're not held to this same standard. You might say, well, that don't sound fair. But when you think about it, it really is. Because when you think about it, it is normal. It is expected for those who are in the world to hate each other. That's what they do. They do not know God's love. They do not have God's love. And so that's the norm for those in the world. It's not out of the ordinary for them to hate each other. But now listen, things are different when you're a Christian. Or at least they are supposed to be. The standards are much higher. The rules are much stricter. And that's the reason that Jesus called the path that we are to follow in life the straight and the narrow. Not the crooked and the broad. Okay? A lost person, they don't fear or respect God. And so that means that they don't really have regard for His commandments either. They don't care about Him. Why should they care about what He wants? Oh, but when you get saved, when Jesus comes into your life, when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart and you're born again, that changes everything. Everything changes. Because now you have a love for Him inside of you. And that love makes all the difference. It truly does. Because Jesus said that if we love Him, then we will show it by keeping His commandments. 1 John 3, 23 tells us that this is His commandment. That we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Love one another. The law and all of the prophets is summed up by this. That we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. And we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Love, love, love. That's His commandment. So by not loving a fellow Christian, we've broken the Lord's commandment. And I guess you could say we've committed the big one. Because for a child of God, for a Christian, there's nothing worse than that. The most serious and the most heinous crime that we could commit in God's eyes would be to not love one another. What's worse than that for Christians? Anger towards our brother or sister in Christ is a sign that we don't love them like we should. It's a sign that there is something wrong. Something's missing. Because when you truly love someone, you can't and you won't stay angry at them forever. You won't. No matter how much we may try to convince ourselves otherwise. Certainly not for years and years, the way that some people in church have done, the way that some people who claim to love God have done. No. If you really love that person, the way that God loves that person, the way that God wants you to love that person, then somehow you will find it in your heart to forgive them. And yes, that means whether they ask you to or not. Whether they give you a formal, sincere apology or they turn their nose up at you. You certainly shouldn't hold their trespasses against them for years on end. That just does not fit in the life of a believer. No, if you know God's love, if you know Him like I know Him, then you will forgive them the same way that God forgave you for Christ's sake. Not for their sake. Not even for your own sake. But for His sake. Do it for Jesus. Whether they deserve to be forgiven in your mind or not. We'll be suspected of murder if we are angry with our brother. But also, if we are angry without a cause. Verse 22 again. 
But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. Now right there is where a lot of people are going to say, yeah, this. This is why I'm angry. This is why I'm still angry. Because I've got a cause to be. I've got a good reason to be. And so, preacher, I agree with everything that you've said so far. No, it's not good for us to be angry with each other, especially with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But you see, my case is different. My situation is unique. I've got a reason to be angry. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know how bad they hurt me or my family. And so surely even God understands and agrees that I've got a good cause to be angry. I've got a good cause to remain angry. Fam. Really? You sure? Absolutely sure about that. How do you know that God thinks that your cause is justified? How do you know that God doesn't hold it against you for feeling the way that you do towards one of your brothers or sisters in Christ? Did you ask Him? And just what is a good cause for being angry anyway? And who decides? Well, ultimately, there is only one way for us to be sure about what's right for us to be angry about and what's not right for us to be angry about. And that's by doing what we should always do with everything in our lives. And that is look to and follow Christ's example. So that's what I want us to do today, to try to answer this. I want you to think about how cruel the people were that crucified Jesus. And I want you to think about all of the awful things that they did to him that day. I want you to think about how they spat on him and how they plucked out his beard. How they whipped him and they beat him and they scourged him until you couldn't even recognize him as a man. And I want you to think about the way they took a crown of thorns and put it on his head. The way they drove nails into his hands and his feet. And the spear that they thrust into his side. And then compare that with what the person you're mad at did to you. There's really no comparison, is there? And yet, despite all of that, Jesus was not angry at the crowd that day. Even as they cried out, crucify Him, crucify Him, He never got angry, did He? In fact, He prayed for them. He prayed for their forgiveness. He did not hold their anger and their hatred against them. He did not return it Unto them. I'd say Jesus had a good cause to be angry. Wouldn't you? And yet he wasn't. Say, okay preacher. Got me there. But didn't you say that being angry in and of itself was not a sin? Was not wrong? Yep. And there are some times and there are some particular situations in life where it is perfectly reasonable and it's totally justified to be angry and upset. And to know when that is, we do the same thing. We have to look at the Lord's life. Christ must ever be our example, the pattern that we go by. And so there was this one particular instance the Bible tells us about where I believe that not only was Jesus angry, But he was downright furious. And it was on that day when he drove the money changers and those who sold doves out of the temple. Out of his father's house. The Bible says that he took a whip 
and he beat them with it. He poured out their money and he flipped over their tables. The Lord was mad, wasn't he? Yes, I believe he was. And so folks, this shows us that we have every right to be angry with anyone who would try to harm God's house. Who would try to turn it into a house of merchandise or a den of thieves. Anybody who would try to use God's house or use God's name for their own personal benefit is somebody who needs a whooping and deserves to be run off. Following Christ's example. That's what should happen. But, this is also the only time in his whole life that we see the Lord showing anger. Can you think of another time? This is the only time Jesus ever used force on anyone. So what does that tell me and you? I believe it tells us that anything and everything else that somebody might do to us is subject to our forgiveness. Oh, it's quiet in here now, preacher. That's his example. You might say, boy, this is a hard saying, preacher. Who can hear it? Who could possibly live such a way? Well, we should. We ought to. If we truly are to be Christians, if we're truly going to be filled with His Spirit, then folks, we are to strive to be like Him. Because that's what being a Christian is all about. I don't know what else we might think it is, but when you boil it down to its most basic fundamental thing, being a Christian is all about being like Jesus. Being Christ-like. So, now that you've heard what the Bible has to say about being angry, still think you've got a good reason to be angry? You've still got a good reason to remain angry? Still believe God agrees? You've got a good cause. Or could it be that he really just wants you to let it go? To forgive that person so that you can be reconciled to them and just move on with your life. Remember, God's the one passing judgment here, so what you and I think doesn't really matter. He's the one who's going to decide. He's the one who determines whether it's right or it's wrong for us to feel the way that we do. And whether we have committed murder in his eyes or not. Final fact, which could condemn us of murder in the Lord's eyes, is anger witnessed by harsh words. Anger that is witnessed by harsh words. The last part of verse 22, he says, And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So it would be good for us to know what the Lord's going to use as evidence to determine our innocence or our guilt. Now when there's a, a real murder, a physical killing takes place, investigators look for certain things. They look for clues. They look for things like a murder weapon, uh, fingerprints, strands of hair, other physical evidence. But folks, I want you to know that the only thing God needs to get a conviction are the words of our mouth. He didn't need actions. Words will do. Jesus warned us that we will be judged for every idle word that comes out of our mouths. Every idle word that we speak, we're going to give an account for. That's a scary thought. It really is. Even though we may not think anything about it at the time, God does. Listen, He's taking notes. He's keeping a record. And He's going to use that record to determine the verdict. Because he's, He hears and He remembers every single word word we've spoken 
He's always listening. And so God knows how we truly feel about someone by the way that we talk about them both in their presence and behind their back, because he hears both. Remember? He doesn't just hear the nice, sweet things that we say to their face. He also hears the nasty, ugly stuff that we say when they're not around. His word says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in here comes out here. And so if we have love in our heart for that person, then that's what's going to come out here. Loving words, the way we talk to them, the way that we talk about them, will make it evident because we'll talk about them in a loving, caring, and uplifting way. But if we speak harshly to them or about them, If we say cruel and unkind things behind their back, then folks, God's judgment is going to be that we don't really love that person. Not like we should, anyway. And so we've broken His commandment. Remember? Love one another. Love one another. We'll be guilty of failing to love our brother as He would have us to. And that could make us guilty as a murderer in his eyes. Folks, this is serious, serious stuff. It really is, and I urge you to take it that way. Because I don't want even one of us to stand before God someday and find ourselves on trial for murder. God forbid. I don't want you to enter eternity without having been warned about the danger of anger in the life of a child of God. So if you are angry with one of your brothers today, without a cause, if you're speaking harsh, unkind words about them, you're in a dangerous place. You're on dangerous ground. And I urge you to rid yourself of that danger right now. How, you might say? By doing exactly what we talked about earlier. Number one, Admit it. Confess it to God. Say, Lord, I've got a problem with this person, and I can't seem to fix it. I can't seem to solve it. Confess it to Him. And then number two, come to Him. Bring it to Him. Say, Lord, I need your help. Will you please help me with this? Give me your strength. Give me your grace so that I can finally Let this go, and I can truly be free from it. Father, we all struggle with anger. We all have our moments of weakness when we fall short. But God, I believe that you may be talking to each one of us in a specific way about anger that we've held on to, maybe for a very long time. Lord, help us to see how that does not fit in the life of a child of God. Could never fit in the life of someone who was following you, trying to be like you, trying to live like you. Lord, I pray that you would just deal with our hearts today. Help us to see that there's nothing more important than loving you with all of our heart, soul, and mind and loving each other as you love us. And forgave us. Might be someone here today, Lord, that needs to just let something go. Something they've carried many years. Lord, help them to see that they can be free of that. That you can help us to overcome anything in our lives. No matter how long it's been, no matter how much it's hurt. God, you can heal us. God, you can fix us. I just pray that we will call upon you now so that you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. That's when my 
trust him he's not going to change the way he thinks about me or the way he feels about me no matter what it is folks I fully believe that God's people should not be angry people that just does not fit with who God wants us to be with who he's called us to be if that's something that you're struggling with that you've been holding on to for a long time just like this song says I urge you bring it to him he can lift that off of you today you can be free from that finally whatever it is if you're willing to let it go he can take it from you I believe that with all my heart might be some folks go home and talk about the preacher today just remember the Lord's listening <laughs> <laughs> All hearts and minds clear. All right. Hope to see you back here tonight. Forget about what else is going on. This is the place to be. God bless you.